Welcome back to Inside Story. In advance of the coming peace conference at Montreux, Switzerland, we're looking at international attempts to stop the civil war in Syria. Hadi al-Bahra of the Syrian National Coalition, still with me from Istanbul. Also joining the conversation, Joshua Landis, director of the Center for Middle East Studies at the University of Oklahoma, and Nader Hashemi, director of the Center for Middle East Studies at the University of Denver. Joshua Landis, let me start with you. What's the United States up to, and has it made any progress in its efforts to stop the fighting in Syria? Well, it hasn't made a lot of progress. There's complete chaos on the ground on the rebel side who've been fighting each other tooth and nail, as you mentioned in your startup. And um, the, the worry on the part of the opposition is that if they begin to talk to Assad, he's quite powerful on the ground now. He's made a number of advances, and that this could lead to the partition of Syria. You'd get a rebel-controlled Syria in the north and a regime-controlled Syria in the south. And they don't want that. They want to destroy Assad and overturn him. The Americans have promised that he will step down. So what their real beef is, is to try to hold the Americans' feet to the fire and make them actually deliver on this promise that they made at Geneva 1, that Assad would step down. Because um, they don't have the power to do that themselves. And so that's, that's the, the tractations that are going on right now are in an effort to commit America to the position that Assad has to go. Obama said that early in this fight. He perhaps regrets it today. But America has been stepping back from that position and, uh, and stopped supplying arms, stopped supplying aid of any kind to the rebels. So that's, that is, in, in part, the game that's being played here on the lead up to this uh, Geneva II meeting. Nader Hashemi, Assad must go has been the position of the United States from the beginning, or close to the beginning. But uh, Assad has two very potent and important regional allies in Russia and Iran. What's their stake in what happens going forward? Well, both countries, Russia and Iran, have their interests in preserving the um, Assad regime, um, which is why they're backing them. And I think as um, Joshua Landis correctly point out, pointed out in his comments that without any uh, pressure on the ground, without any political power, military power, to remove Assad, there's no reason for him to leave. He's not going to simply sort of stand up and say, well, I... My family have been, myself and my family have been in power for 43 years, and now it's time to sort of share political power and transit to democracy. Um, and so he's riding um, um, very high in the um, political stakes in, in Syria today. He has strong regional backing. The opposition is fragmented and it's weak. And there's no sense that um, anything positive is going to come out of the um, meetings in uh, Switzerland unless there is uh, political force that can push the Assad regime to agree to a political transition to um, a, a better government, a future government. But Professor Hashemi, looking at what's going gone on over the last year and a half, why aren't Iran and Russia looking past Assad to the eventual leaders of the country? I mean, what's the use of having an ally who's the king of the rubble in a denuded state with uh, most of its population outside the national borders? and a totally destroyed infrastructure? Well, that's a good question. I mean, that was a, a question that I think had much more potency and relevancy a couple of years ago. But now it seems like Assad is stronger today than he was six months ago. He seems to be riding out this political um, uh, conflict. Um, uh, both Russia and Iran, as I said, have different interests. Uh, for Iran, the stakes are huge. Um, access to its key ally in the region, Hezbollah, passes through Syria. Iran has been heavily invested in preserving the Assad regime. It knows that if the Assad regime falls, its regional clout and influence diminishes uh, by a huge proportion. And so it's doing everything it can, not for, ID, not, not for reasons of you know, political theology or, 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 or you know, um, anything that has to do with you know, you know, religion, but because of sheer naked power calculations. If Assad leaves power, Saudi Arabia and its allies will increase their power because most likely the successor regime will be friendly to Saudi Arabia. So Iran is backing the Assad regime um, to the end. And it seems like, you know, based on today's calculations, that Iran and Assad and Russia are winning. Hadi al barra what about that suggestion from our two professors that uh, Bashar al-Assad is more in control of Syria than people realized 
and stronger, perhaps, than people gave him credit for earlier in this war. Actually, I don't share this uh, analysis or view because his power now mainly relies on foreign uh, players in the Syrian crisis. He lost, you know, the, the his uh, reserve of manpower to fight his war. So he, they came to aid him. You know, Hezbollah has now became a part of the fight in Syria, coming from Lebanon. Uh, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas militias coming from Iraq other volunteers coming from Pakistan and Bangladesh and others. So that's a clear, I mean, uh, indication that he is now surviving based on using uh, foreign aids and foreign military uh, aids to his regime. And Professor Landis, is there a risk for those foreigners who are getting involved that they get a bloody nose and get diminished in the process themselves, like Hezbollah, which uh, Hadi al Barra just mentioned? Well, the, the much bigger risk for them is if they lose and if the, the, the Shiite Alawite regime collapses. Iran does have an ideological stake in this, and that is supporting Shiites throughout the Arab world. And if they allow their allies in Syria to collapse and be defeated by Saudi Arabia and the Sunnis, who are the rebel, the, the, the rebel forces are made up of Sunnis, this would be a big blow to not only their allies in Hezbollah and in Iraq, uh, perhaps Bahrain as well, but it would be a big boost for Saudi Arabia. So Iran is holding the line, and what it sees is a Sunni onslaught effort to overturn Iranian interests. And this gets us into the nuclear question, the larger questions about Shiites versus Sunnis, and the Russians versus the United States. So it's linked up on various different levels to an international struggle. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we'll talk more about the big powers surrounding Syria that turn out to have a big stake in its future. This is Inside Story. Every Sunday. Welcome back to Inside Story. I'm Ray Suarez. On this edition of our program, we're talking about the civil war in Syria. There are talks scheduled in Switzerland later this month, but it's far from certain which parties to the crisis will be at the table. And Professor Hashimi, uh, let's talk a little bit more about what Professor Landis brought up just before the break, that now both the United States and Russia have a big stake in what happens in, uh, in Damascus. Uh, he can't hear us. Okay, well, I'll, I'll move on to, uh, to Hadi al Barra. I was interested, sir, in knowing what happened to Syria. If you look at the history after World War II of many of the countries in the region, there was a very heavy emphasis on nationalism, on a sort of secular nationalism that stressed being Syrian over being Christian or Sunni or Shia or Druze or any of the uh, regional varieties of people. Uh, what happened to Syrian nationalism? The idea that being Syrian was more important than these other things that now divide your countrymen. For sure, we'll continue as a Syrian to have our pride in our national belonging and our regional belonging also to the Arab uh, uh, world and we'll continue our uh, struggle to establish a new Syria, free Syria, secular Syria, and to uh, regain our rights as a people, to uh, rewrite our constitution, and also elect our leaders as, uh, as free citizens of one country, united under one flag and under one leadership. Uh, let me go back to Denver because we've uh, cleared up our technical problem. Professor Hashimi, uh, Joshua Landis mentioned before the break that now both the United States and Russia are watching very closely. How did we get into an almost Cold War moment once again, where these two big countries are using proxies uh, to work out their differences in the world? This, this feels in a way like 1965 or 1955, not 2014. Um, it does. Um, I think Russia is asserting itself. Um, it's called 
Obama's bluff on many occasions, particularly after the use of chemical weapons on a massive scale this past summer. And Obama, um, due to a number of issues related to the legacy of the Iraq war, a failing economy, a focus on the Iran nuclear deal, has refused to challenge the Russian position. And so Russia effectively is um, setting the course and the pace of the diplomatic negotiations related to the Syria conflict. So I think that's how we got to where we are today. Professor Landis, did the United States have a lousy hand to play from the beginning and perhaps with the setting of red lines and boundaries and uh, setting down of preconditions only made it worse? Um, in part, that's true. And certainly this, this contest has been going on for some time. Russia believes quite strongly that Syria and perhaps other countries in the region are not ready for democracy, that they need a strong man to lead them, somebody a little bit like Putin in Russia itself. And that America has taken the view that democracy is the answer for these regimes. We did try to assert democracy in Iraq and in Afghanistan. We've now lost our confidence on this score, and I think President Obama did not want and feel that Syria was a country that he wanted to really double down in and prove that democracy would work in Syria. So he has abandoned the field a little bit, and, uh, and he's allowed the Russians to, in a sense, shape Syria. In some ways, we defied the Russians and took Afghanistan in 1980 away from the Russians by arming up the Mujahideen and driving them out. And I think in many ways, Americans regret that they did that. They feel that they got Al-Qaeda, they got a bad hand in Afghanistan, and that in this way, in some ways, America is deferring to Russia <coughs> in Syria because it doesn't have very deep interests in Syria. And uh, we haven't had relations with Syria, very bad relations we've had for 30 years. We've had sanctions on them. We have no trade with Syria. Syria is not a major interest for the United States. And that's why I think President Obama does not want to spend billions of American dollars on Syria. And it is deferring to the neighbors, both Saudi Arabia and Russians. Professor, uh, I mean, Hari Barra, before we go, very briefly, uh, you heard what Joshua Landis just had to say. Uh, the various armies in the field that are fighting Bashar al-Assad do agree that they want that dictator gone, but it seems they agree on very little else. Do they have in common an idea of what kind of Syria would emerge after the revolution is over? That is why the coalition has existed. As you know, if we uh, account all the fighting and fighters on the ground from the regime side and from the freedom fighters side, they don't amount to more than 6% of the total population of Syria. So the majority of the Syrians are the ones who are not taking part in this fight, and we have to be sure that their voice is heard, and they are the one who will draw up the future of Syria and make sure that it's safe, free, and democratic for our children and uh, Hadi Al-Barra, Joshua Landis, Hashemi, uh, Nader Hashemi, thank you all. That brings us to the end of this edition of Inside Story. Thanks for being with us. In Washington, I'm Ray Suarez.